Hey everybody. In today's video, I am going to finish a no line watercolor that I started at Kathy Rakusen's On the Road Coloring Challenge event. I am using an adorable honeybee stamp today, and I was teaching people how to get the best results with watercolor over the weekend at the event. And I'll give you some of the tips that I gave them there. This is as far as I got while I was showing people how to watercolor. And so I thought I would just finish it today. I'm going to start by finishing the shadow under the pumpkin. And what I'm doing is just putting down a little bit of water with a somewhat dirty brush. Sorry about that. And most of the mistakes that happen in watercolor happen with how much water you put down. And so when you first put down water, if you want to get a blended look like I'm going for on the ground and like I got on the pumpkin, you want to start with damp watercolor paper and lightly drop your color in. You'll see me wiping off my paintbrush as I go. That's to control the water more at the edges because the drier my paintbrush is, the better chance I will have it fading out that ground color almost to the white of the page. So the ticket is if you have a big puddle of water on your watercolor paper to start with, the pigment follows the water. Water is like a magnet for watercolor pigment. And it wants to go as far as it can towards the water. And it will end up pooling at the edge of that puddle that you have and give you those hard edges that we all hate so much. So I control the water with a little towel, and to be honest, sometimes at home my hand, <laughs> but I don't encourage that. And by drying off my brush continually as I try to get a better blend, that helps me control the water and get a soft, soft blend like you would get with markers. Now you saw me put a little bit of blue and a little bit of orange into the shadow. That's to mimic her jeans and the pumpkin. And now I'm doing something that shocked everybody this weekend. And I'm adding a deep dark purple. This is quinacridone purple. This is my favorite shadow color. And you're thinking, but there's orange and green there. Yeah, there is. Contrary to popular belief, which is sort of how I like to live my life, Purple is the perfect shadow color for pretty much everything. I'm also adding my Jane's Gray custom mixed gray that I love very much. It's very similar to Payne's Gray. And I'm adding that over the purple. And what you get when you mix colors in a shadow is you get the most interesting shadow in the world. So I encourage you to do that. Don't be afraid of colors that people have told you you can and can't mix. You know what you can and can't mix? You cannot mix rules with art, and that is a fact. The best thing about a shadow is if you can actually see it. So I like to put dramatically dark shadows in small amounts around objects that I'm painting. So you'll see that shadow is very, very dark under the pumpkin. And what that does is just bring the pumpkin forward towards your eye. I'm adding a little bit of burnt sienna light. I heard Kathy say at the coloring challenge event that she does something called color plucking when she travels where, and she's a Copic marker genius. I am not. But what she does is she just deliberately chooses colors that she wouldn't normally work with. And she just picks a few of them because traveling with your art supplies can be hard. I chose this split group of Daniel Smith watercolor to go to the event this weekend. This is split C and split D from my watercolor group. And that is determining what I'm using on this painting. So instead of choosing colors for the painting, I just brought my colors and then I painted my painting with them. And sometimes you find things that you just love that way. 
So limited palette is kind of where I am these days. And I really like it. It's just, it forces you to do things you wouldn't naturally do. Now, another thing that I used to think, because I used to not look at the world with my eyeballs, I used to look at it with my brain before I really started practicing watercolor. I used to think that things in the background were darker than they were in the foreground. And that is a lie. So on this painting, number one, because I love this pumpkin and I love this little girl, I wanted those obviously to stand out. But number two, because the background really is lighter than the foreground, I'm deliberately watering down the colors that I'm using for these little trees. And the trees are very detailed and I'm not going to worry about that because I don't have to. There is no one here forcing me to worry about things I don't want to worry about, so I'm just not going to. But I'm taking the same colors that were in the pumpkin. I'm taking the orange, I'm taking the yellow, the green, just from the mixing dishes that I've been using, and I'm watering them down and just doing the hint of little leaves. And I believe this is my number two brush. I basically use my number two and my number four brush the most. You saw me use my number eight for the ground, and that's because I needed more water in the brush to be able to do a wider area. But for actual painting of stamp images, I really like the two and the four. I like to paint somewhat small, so that works for me. These little mixing dishes, I will have a link to these below. Kathy really liked these two. It just makes it easy to pull out a little bit of color and get it the right saturation that you would like it, like I'm doing with the trees. And I just want little hints of color back here. The other thing I talked about this weekend is you really need good watercolor paper. And by good watercolor paper, I mean only 100% cotton paper. If you are not getting the results you want, so for example, if you first put down a little bit of watercolor and the paper grabs it and it feels like it won't move, then you're not working on 100% watercolor paper. You're working on a mixture of cotton and something else, or you're working on something else, which just kind of frightens me. So for some non-pigment mediums that you use with water, for example, markers, there are a lot of water-based markers that you can watercolor with that work great on those non cotton papers because those are inks they're not pigments but pigments are going to rebel on you on something that isn't 100% cotton so please don't start a rebellion please get 100% cotton watercolor paper and just save the world i'd appreciate it very much i use pretty much the same brand all the time and that's linked in the supplies below and on my blog. And you will be very happy with that. It also comes in a five by seven, which what I do is I always just cut that in half. So I always have a three and a half by five piece of watercolor paper that I'm working on. And that's what I use on all my cards. If you see a watercolor card of mine, the panel on it is three and a half by five. It's plenty big enough for most stamp images. And it fits great in your mini Misty, which is even better. So now I'm adding a little bit of sepia in a little more concentrated dose. If you can call watercolor a dose, just to add an accent to the side of these trees and also to add a little shadow. Sorry, not a shadow. Well, it could be a shadow, a shadow, a reflection, something on the left and a hint of the color of the leaves on the ground because in Rochester you always saw the colors of the leaves on the ground under the tree and it was all sort of impressionistic the first thing you see in Rochester in the fall is just color you don't see the trees you don't see the details and I wanted to kind of go for that look now I'm using this 
amazing ink, my perfect one true soul ink here today. Designed for no line watercolor, I had been very restless lately, getting tired of using yellow, could never find an ink that was light enough and neutral enough. And what's cool about this ink is it's waterproof. So as you're painting, it's light enough that it disappears when you paint, but it doesn't disappear all the way while you're putting your details down, which is what makes it a great no-line watercolor ink because you need the details there to paint by, but you also need it to be light enough not to interfere with your painting. And somehow she came up with this magic ink and I love it. So I'm also using this ink. I didn't want to use black. But I'm stamping this over and over again on the face of the kitty and the face of the little girl. Just to put her eye and her mouth back and the kitty's eye and nose back. Faintly, not so that it's just stark black because that would be kind of weird in this painting, I think. But just enough of a hint that you can see what their faces look like. So I'm wiping it away from everywhere else. It probably wouldn't matter because my painting is dark enough there that it's okay. And if I just do it a couple of times, I can get it dark enough to where you can see those face details, but to where they have a harmonious value with the rest of the painting. So there's my card for today. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks so much for watching.